Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Museum of Science, home of the William and Charlotte Bloomberg Science Education Center and the National Center for Technological Literacy. I'm Yanis Miaoulis, President and Director of the Museum of Science. And on behalf of the Boards of Trustees and Overseers, I'm pleased to welcome you all to this very special event. So as I was uh, standing there, uh, one fellow came and told me, this is such an amazing event. There are so many super geek celebrities here. <laughs> and I'm so happy to hear that. And I welcome all geek celebrities and non-celebrities, all fans of science and engineering. At this time, I would like to thank our two Sametir sponsors, Joy Lucas and Andrew Schulert, and Susie and Michael Thonis. And my thanks to all of our table sponsors. As you know, this is a fundraising event. And through ticket sales and sponsorships tonight, you help us raise over $100,000 for the Museum of Science. And tonight, we present the 53rd Bradford Washburn Award. Back in 1964, a museum trustee made an anonymous donation to establish and endow the Bradford Washburn Award. In doing so, he gave the Museum of Science two great gifts. The first gift is the ability to bring some of the world's leading scientists, authors, inventors, explorers, teachers, researchers, engineers, and broadcasters to the museum for a special evening that engages and invigorates our community every year. The second gift is the opportunity to honor the legacy and achievement of our founding director, Bradford Washburn, each year at this award ceremony. The Bradford Washburn Award recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions toward the public understanding and appreciation of science and engineering and the vital role it plays in our life. Among the exclusive Washburn Award Club are Oscar and Amy winners, a winner of the Palm d'Or at Cairns, multiple winners of Pulitzer and Peabody Awards, Guggenheim Fellows, and a winner of the Nobel Prize. One of our past Washburn Award honorees is with us tonight, Sir Timothy Burns-Lee, who was one of the 2014 Washburn Awardees, and Sir Tim, of course, is the inventor of the World Wide Web, and he's also a principal investigator of MIT's Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Lab. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Tim. Also joining us tonight are Brad's daughters, Dorothy Lundas, Dundas and Betsy Washburn Cabot, who serves as a museum of overseers. Where are you folks? Thank you so much. Very nice to have you. Jack Little and Gino Coffey from the MathWorks, Gino Key from MathWorks are with us tonight. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank MathWorks for the amazing generous gift of $10 million that they gave us last week. This is the largest corporate gift in the museum's history, and it will support the creation of our new tech studio exhibit, which is scheduled to open right here in the Blue Wing in 2020. Jack and Jean, many thanks to you and everyone at MathWorks for our many years of partnership with the museum and for supporting our educational mission. And I got to tell you, one of the biggest benefits of this gift, we have been, we have been working with the staff of MathWorks. To, to sharpen our thinking about not only this exhibit, but about transforming the whole, the whole Blue Wing, and we'll continue doing so, so thank you. And thanks to Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker for joining us for the reception earlier this evening. After dinner, we will present the 2017 Washburn Award to two very special honorees. Alison Gopnik, Professor of Psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, and Salman Khan, founder of Khan Academy. We're so proud to have you here, so happy you could come. As many of you know, Alice Ogopnik is the author of The Philosophical Baby and The Gardener and the Carpenter. She writes the Mind and Matter Science column for the Wall Street Journal, and she received a bachelor's degree from McGill University and earned her doctorate from Oxford. Salman Khan was recognized as one of Time's 100 most influential people in the world. And his book, 
the One World Schoolhouse, Education Reimagined, outlines a vision for the future of education. He holds three degrees from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. And uh, uh, Governor Baker, whispering to my ear, he's one of my heroes. My kids spend endless time looking at his stuff. We're so proud to honor Alison and Sal, and we will hear from them during dessert. Before we break for dinner, I would like to take a moment to recognize those members of the museum staff who are with us tonight, all of whom have 25 years or more service at the museum, and thank you all so much for your wonderful, dedicated service to the museum. And now let's enjoy our food, and we'll uh, restart our program during dessert, and bon appetit. My name is Gwil York, and I serve as the chair of the Board of Trustees at the Museum of Science, and I'm so happy to see so many friends and colleagues in the audience tonight. I'd like to thank you all for being a part uh, and coming here, and I want to particularly thank Juan Enriquez and Priscillas Douglas, chair and co-chair of the museum's prizes and awards selection committee. Please join me in welcoming to the stage. Uh, well, well, thank you first. Yes, I totally agree. So um, in addition to thanking Juan and um, Priscilla, I hope that you will also help me welcome um, Alison um, Kopnik to the stage. And I think uh, that uh, Giannis is going to escort you. We're lucky we have two uh, awardees tonight because we may get it right the second time, so bear with us. <laughs> so thank you again. We are so pleased that you were able to come, and I've had such a lovely evening with your sister and her family, so thank you very much. So, but uh, most importantly, I want to thank you. I'm honored to present you with the museum's highest honor, the Brad Washburn Award, which includes the Washburn Medal, which you saw earlier, which is really amazing, and uh, an honorarium of twenty thousand dollars. I know you'll put good, uh, you'll put that to good use. Thank you. So I wanted to read a little bit of the citation that is on that uh, piece, uh, that framed uh, medal or uh, in, uh, paper, and it reads in part. Through your prolific writings and public speaking, you have dismantled old beliefs about the capacity of the human brain in small children. Your work challenge us, challenges us as parents, grandparents, educators, and scientists to imagine the possibilities now that we know how babies view the world, how they think, and how they care. Dr. Allison Kopnick, we honor you and salute your extraordinary contribution to society and to public understanding and the appreciation of science and technology. Thank you. So I just need to say I'm so grateful that she got rid of the whole idea of the blank slate of children. I mean, really. I mean, I can't believe we even thought that was real for a while. So thank you. And you're going to say something, right? So thank you. I think I managed to not mess up with your computer, but we'll have somebody make sure. Well, first of all, let me thank everyone here uh, so much for this amazing honor and this wonderful prize, and also for institutions like the Museum of Science. So people often ask me about, to make rather depressing uh, conclusions about what's going to happen in the future of education. And I always point out that the rise of institutions like the Museum of Science these are exactly the institutions that fit what we know from the science about how children and teenagers and even old adults like us actually learn best. Putting children in this kind of a rich environment that they can explore and find out about, that's what the science tells us is the best way for them to learn. And the people who support institutions like this are really the deepest uh, supporters of education. But what I want to do now, just for the next couple of minutes 
is talk a little bit about some ideas that my colleagues and I have been working on uh, just very recently that I think speak to a lot of the big ideas that are behind this institution and in particular behind this prize. So as everyone knows, Bradford Washburn, from whom this prize is, is known, was a famous explorer. And you know, if you look online, the story about him is, well, he kind of had his day job at the Museum of Science, and then he spent all this other weird hobby of going out and exploring. And what the science is telling us is that exploring is what science and children and being human is all about. And I wanted to say a few words about that. So one of the, if you can imagine a, a Alpha Centauran biologist who came to Earth 150,000 years ago and was trying to figure out what was going on with these new little primates that were scrambling around the veld. Um, what would she have seen that would have struck her as being really interesting and unique about these new primates? Well, what she would have seen, she might have seen some little differences in their tool use or their cooperation, but we know that chimps are actually also good at these things. What would have really leapt out at her is our very bizarre life history, as biologists say. And our life history is things like how immature our children are, how long they stay as children, how much work we have to do to take care of them, how long we live as adults. And what you would have seen is that humans have this very strange life history. So this is a beautiful seven-year-old chimpanzee um, in the Gombe. And by the time they're seven years old, uh, chimpanzees are actually producing as much food as they're consuming. So they're actually pulling their own weight when they're seven years old. But even if you look at people who are foragers who are doing the same kind of work we did when we evolved, um, children aren't doing that until they're at least 15 years old. So it's until at least 15 that they're producing as much as they're consuming. And in our culture, my wonderful son is 29, and we can still be writing rent and tuition checks at, uh, uh, at 29. Now, that seems really strange. Why is it that we're investing so much work and time and energy into just keeping our babies and children alive? And we've been doing this for as long as we've been human. So at the same time that we developed this very long period of immaturity, um, we developed pair bonding so that um, fathers became involved in caring for children as well as mothers, unlike our closest primate relatives. Um, we developed my personal favorite, grandmothers. So we actually have postmenopausal women, women living past menopause. This is something that no other creature except killer whale, I can talk about killer whales later on, um, actually does. And anthropologists now think that those grandmothers played a really crucial role in keeping those children alive. And we developed what anthropologists call alloparents, which means that people who aren't actually biologically related to children nevertheless put tremendous investment into taking care of children, giving them uh, rich resources. So, you know, everyone in this room is an example of an alloparent. That's not just a recent invention. That's been true of us as long as we've been human. Why would we do this? You know, given that babies are sort of useless and arguably worse than useless because we have to put so much time into taking care of them, that seems sort of evolutionarily paradoxical. Why would we see this pattern, and why would we see all these changes happening so quickly in the course of human evolution? Well, it turns out that if you look across many, many different species of animals, you see this really striking relationship. So, for instance, if you look not just at primates like us, but look at marsupials, look at the kind of animals that grow in pouches, it turns out that there's a very uh, striking relationship between how big a brain they have, how good they are at learning, and how long a period of childhood they have. So, for example, that's the world's cutest animal, a quokka, um, versus uh, perhaps the world's dumbest mammal, the possum, um, with apologies to any possum lovers in the audience. Um, and the quokka babies stay in the uh, mom's pouch for uh, as long as a year. The possum babies are quickly ready to go out into the world, and the uh, the quokkas have pair bonding and alloparents. For the possums, it's only the mums who take care of the, uh, of the babies. Now, I think if you're actually a human mother, your life often feels more like the picture of the possum than the picture of the quokka. We could all use more backlighting in our lives. Um, 
But in fact, we're much more like the crocus. Uh, sorry, and the quokka's brains are twice as big as the possum's brain. Um, uh, the quokkas are animals that learn. The possums are animals that can do one or two things extremely well. And you can see this even if you look not even at mammals, but look at birds. And in fact, the original place where biologists saw this relationship was comparing different kinds of species of birds. So, for example, this is a New Caledonian crow, and crows and corvids and ravens are extremely intelligent animals. This New Caledonian crow has learned how to use a, a bend a wire to make a hook. These animals are as good at tool use as chimpanzees are. Um, in contrast, our friend the domestic chicken, again with apologies to chicken lovers in the audience, um, is basically as, we have to, I have to say this when I'm giving this talk at Berkeley, um, is basically as dumb as a stump. Um, basically, chickens are very good at pegging for grain, not very good at doing anything else. The chickens are mature within a few weeks. Um, crows are fledglings for as long as a year, and these New Caledonian crows are fledglings for as long as two years, which is a very long time in the life of a crow. And the crows are pair bonded, so the crows have this strategy of having lots and lots of adults taking care of the children. You can even see this relationship in insects. So this is an amazing new study that I just, uh, I just discovered, looking at cabbage white butterflies. So it turns out that among cabbage white butterflies, um, some of the butterflies are very, very much innately determined to go to green vegetables. So this is a cabbage white on kale. And they can recognize that green things are good things to land on and good things to eat. But there's a subset of the butterflies who have actually learned that there is more to life than kale. Um, actually, with apologies to any kale lovers in the audience, this is something I have to deal with in Berkeley as well. So, so these are actually animals that can figure out that they go out and explore lots of different food sources, and they can discover that a red food source actually is a good food for source, and then go to that food source. Well, because they're insects, you can actually do experiments that show that the uh, animals that are capable of learning about the red food have a much longer period to reproduction than the animals that don't. And you can actually go in and give them hormones that change their period of immaturity. And as their immaturity gets longer, their learning abilities get longer. Um, now, of course, human beings are far off on the end of the spectrum on all of these dimensions. We have the biggest brains. We have the most flexibility, we're the best at learning, and we have the longest childhood, sometimes till 29 or so. Um, what was it that led to this, uh, this life history with this extremely long childhood? Well, there's lots of different theories, but one idea is that our evolutionary niche is the unknown unknowns. So what happened in the course of human evolution was not that the climate got worse or better, it's that the climate got much less predictable, so the extremes got changed. So now, of course, we're dealing with um, now, of course, we're dealing with human-induced climate change. But in the past, we had climate change-inducing humans. Um, so what we had to do was not so much be very good at dealing with one particular environment, the way that the chickens or the kale-loving butterflies are. We had to learn how to adapt to many, many, many different unpredictable environments. And of course, as we developed our capacities for culture, for social organization, the environments we grew up in got less and less predictable and more and more variable. So every generation is growing up in a slightly different world than the generation that preceded it. Um, and what we think is that it's that requirement to deal with unexpected change and variability that really led to this incredibly um, drastic change in our life history and our extended childhood. And the way that we've been thinking about this is in terms of a contrast that people in neuroscience and also in computer science talk about between two ways that you can deal with an environment. It's a contrast between exploitation and uh, exploration. And the idea is if you're trying to solve a problem, trying to solve a complicated problem, one thing that you can do is you can just look pretty close to the places where you already are. So you can just try and solve the problem easily and quickly. 
But another thing you can do is explore, go out, try a million different things, some of them that work and some of them that don't work, without caring very much about whether you're actually going to be able to implement this as a good solution. And what neuroscience and computer science tells us is there's an intrinsic trade-off between these two ways of solving a problem. If you're exploring all the different options that you can imagine, you're searching around in this kind of bouncy way through the possible space of solutions, um, you're not going to be, you're unlikely to find one that's good enough really quickly. You kind of don't want to be exploring while the mastodon is actually charging at you. Um, whereas if you settle just on the solution that looks good on the surface, you might miss a solution that's actually much better. And one way that people solve this problem is to say, start out just by exploring. Start out by considering all the possible solutions. And in order to do that, you have to have a protected period where you're not worrying about whether the next meal is coming from or what's happening with that next charging mastodon. Start out just doing this exploration and then narrow in and find the right solutions that you can use to exploit. And essentially what we've been arguing is that children are evolution's way, human children are evolution's way of solving this explore-exploit trade-off. So children are the ones who are designed to be noisy and bouncy and variable and all over the place. And I'm sure visitors to the museum will have noticed this noisy, bouncy, all over the place exploratory behavior. And we grown-ups invest in giving those children a safe, protected, rich environment that they can explore. That's really our job. Then as adults, we can take all those discoveries that we made when we were these wild exploratory children, and we can put them to use to deal with the new challenging environment that we're going to be seeing uh, the next day. And you can even see this kind of explore-exploit trade-off in, uh, in brain development. So uh, this is one of my favorite studies. This is a study looking at how many, this is very suitable for this moment as we've all finished our dessert. How many calories do you use up? Uh, how many calories does your brain use up when you're just sitting there? It turns out brains are very expensive gadgets. So about 20% of, of that, that delicious dessert that you just had, 20% of that glucose is actually going to your brain at this moment. I've always thought if you were thinking deep thoughts, you should use up more calories, but it turns out that's not really true. Um, uh, but if you look across development, it turns out that when you were four years old, 66% of your calories were going to your brain. And again, if you know any four-year-olds, that kind of makes sense. So basically a four-year-old is a giant hungry brain attached to this little body that's going around the world making you his slaves and getting you to feed his hungry brain. That's a pretty good description of my grandson. Uh, so again, this process is costly. There's this tremendous activity that's happening in our brains early on. And we have good evidence from neuroscience that the form that activity is taking is a kind of exploration. So this is a famous slide showing uh, the number of synaptic connections, the number of, of uh, connections between neurons, synapses happening at various ages of development. And what you can see is that up till about age five, you're making a lot more new connections than you're getting rid of. So you're making lots and lots and lots of new connections. And then what happens is there's a tipping point where you keep the connections that you use a lot. They become strong and effective. Um, but you actually prune, get rid of the connections that you haven't used. So you go from an explore brain, an early brain that's very much what neuroscientists call plastic, very susceptible to the environment, very, very good at learning new things, thinking of things in new ways, to an adult brain, but is not capable of putting on its snowsuit in the morning when it has to get out to preschool, to an adult brain that's with this lean, mean machine, very effective, very good at making things happen, and not nearly as good at being flexible, at learning how to deal with new environments, including the new environments that we create ourselves. So, you know, a 62-year-old brain that is much worse at figuring out how the iPhone works than her four-year-old grandson is. Um, uh, so let me actually, you know, I do all of this science to try to show this, but let me end up by actually giving you some of the reasons that I think this is really true, aside from all the science that I do, which is just looking at uh, 
the kinds of things that children do. And this is from an experiment that we designed but was carried out by Christine Laguerre, where this child is just figuring out this child is just figuring out how this little machine works. I printed this on the box and this on the box. Look. Uh huh. That this makes that light up the box. Mm hmm. How about this? That makes the other side. Ah. Oh. This one's lighting up, and this one's not. So that means... Hmm. It's making this light up. If you've ever wondered hmm. if children are like scientists, that facial expression, any scientist in the audience will recognize. children um, uh, who will continue to be taken care of all the time, but it's what I hope we could design our social institutions to do so that not just children in the museum, but all children could use those abilities that seem to be their deepest human abilities for exploration and knowledge. And let me end there. And thank you all again for... That was amazing. I wish you could stay up here all night, and I don't know where you're staying because I have so many questions. So, Giannis, I'm hoping that you could um, escort Sal Khan up. We are so lucky to have two great educators in understanding how we learn. So, um, Sal, I'm honored to present the Washburn uh, Award which includes the Washburn Medal and the honorarium of 20,000, and I'm sure you're gonna use it really wisely as well. And I wanna read a little part of the citation. It has many paragraphs, but of particular note, um, you're an author, a visionary, an innovator. You have pioneered a new paradigm for education in the 21st century, and it'll, it'll probably last for like quite a ways in our century, so thank you for your passion, your resourcefulness, your leadership, your love of learning, They've all inspired teachers, school districts, and millions of students to explore a more creative, interactive, learning-centered approach. And I think we now know 
the neuroscience that you were using. Khan Academy has emboldened teachers to flip their classrooms, homework routine, so that students watch a tutorial online at their own pace and then follow up with hands-on learning in class. We're honored to have you and salute your extraordinary contribution to society and to the public's understanding and appreciation of science and technology. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read that in my low self-esteem moments. <laughs> oh, perfect. That's great. So, so I like to, to start uh, presentations like this, just getting a sense of, of the crowd. Uh, how many of you all uh, have children who've used Khan Academy? Oh, good number. And how many of you have used it yourself? And, oh, there, yeah, there you go. Oh, there, wow. We've got a good uh, team here. And, and, and how many of you have no idea what Khan Academy is before today? Okay, good. That's, that's why we're here. All right, very nice. So, so as was introduced, you know, a lot of folks uh, associate Khan Academy with a collection of videos that I started making for families, and that's part of it. But we'll see that it's a lot more than that. But just to get everyone on the same page, I will show a montage of what those videos look like. Interactions are just through the gravity. This is an age right after Isaac Newton. I'm told the humidity makes it feel hotter. Why is this? Excellent question, LeBron. And you can just see the pleasure he had. The right to privacy as such is not spelled out in the Constitution. Of course, the word liberty is. Two things actually can interbreed, although for these two in particular, it seems like the mechanics would get kind of difficult. And I can keep playing around with these numbers and see what kind of colors I can come up with. If this does not blow your mind, then you have no emotion. So this right over here, this is, as I mentioned, it's more than videos. This is what the software on Khan Academy looks like. It's actually most of what the, the team, which is much more than me now, is working on where students can go, whether it's in math or the humanities. This is actually a history exercise that a teacher could assign or a student can learn at their own time or pace. There's a bunch of game mechanics to ensure that students keep learning. They can uh, learn in kind of a mastery fashion, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Teachers get all sorts of uh, dashboards and things so they can keep track of, of what's going on in class, hopefully liberate the classroom. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So just to kind of frame the, the conversation, because a lot of folks assume, oh, you know, it's a nice thing online. But what we're, what we're really aiming to do, and this was a little bit delusional, and I'll tell uh, the story of how all this started uh, maybe four or five years ago. But the goal really is to start an institution for the world that provides a free world-class education for anyone anywhere. And there's kind of three pieces to that. One is, ideally, students do have access to a classroom. But if they do have access to a classroom, it could be a lot. If we can give uh, exercises and lessons at students' own time and pace, well, then it could free up time in the class to be a lot more like what I think Dr. Gopnik would advocate for, more exploration, more peer-to-peer -peer learning, more social development, uh, uh, more simulations, games, uh, whatever it might be. But if a student does not have access to a school or does not have access to a well-resourced school or a good school, well, then we want to make sure that we can raise the floor for them so that if you're whether you're in inner city Boston or you live in a slum in Brazil or, or Mumbai, that if we want to create a world where if you have access to a low cost device, you could self-educate yourself. And then the last leg here is really, and this isn't something we've done yet, but we hope to do is anywhere in the world, prove what you know. We talk a lot about skills gap. We think we can help with the skills, but there's also a notion of how does someone who develops the skills actually prove to everyone else that they've actually mastered the material. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. So this is just a, a snapshot of, of where we are uh, roughly about now. Khan Academy is being used in uh, almost every country, uh, 60 million registered users. And before I talk more about this, I'll, I'll, I'll rewind a little bit about how all of this got started. And it's, it's fun to be here at the, the Museum of Science. I was telling some folks here, the last time I was here was in 1997. Uh, this is completely tangential, but I was a vegetarian that year. And it was an event for the Laboratory for Computer Science at MIT. And they had free sushi, and I was an undergrad. And then it all ended, uh, right? It was, I remember it was like right around there that I just couldn't resist. Uh, but uh, Khan Academy itself also got started not too far from here. Uh, I, was, uh, I did my undergrad here at MIT, and then I came back here for uh, business school. And I was a year out of business school. I was working at a small hedge fund on Newberry Street. 
and I had just gotten married, and I had family visiting me here in Boston from New Orleans, and it just came out of conversation that one of my family members, Navia, who was 12 years old at the time, was having trouble in math, and because of that, they put her into a slower math class. So I offered to, to tutor her. Uh, she agrees. She goes back to New Orleans. I start every day after work. I start working with her over the phone and instant messenger and whatever else. And slowly but surely, she was having trouble with unit conversion. She got unit conversion. Then she got caught up with her class. Then she got a little ahead of her class. At that point, I became what I call a tiger cousin. And I, I called up her school. I'm sure many teachers appreciate calls like this. And, and I said, you know, I, I really think Nadia Rahman should retake that placement exam from last year. They said, who are you? I said, I'm her cousin. And, and they said, and, and surprisingly, they, they actually allowed her to retake it. And the same Nadia that at 12 years old was being placed into a remedial math class was now put into an advanced math class. So that was kind of exciting for me. It was a small intervention on my part. It allowed me to bond with um, a, a family member that was far away. So I immediately started tutoring her younger brothers. And then over the next 18 months, uh, I guess the most significant thing is word gets around the family that free tutoring is going on. <laughs> and I find myself working with 10, 15 cousins, family, friends, uh, every day after work. And my original background was in software, and I, and I saw a, a general trend. Even my cousins, who were fairly good students, they all had gaps in their knowledge. And the reason why they were having trouble with algebra or geometry or physics had nothing to do with their innate ability or some, you know, that the subject was difficult. It was because, you know, th that equation involved a negative exponent and they didn't really learn that well earlier on in seventh grade or eighth grade. And so I started writing some software for them to, to get practice in those skills. And th that was the first Khan Academy. And all my friends knew I had this crazy project with my family and I was showing it off at a dinner party. And the host of the party, his name is Zuli Ramzan, I have to give him a full credit. He says, well, this is all cool, but how are you scaling up your actual lessons? And I said, no, it's, it's difficult to do with 15 cousins that what I was originally doing with, you know, one or two or three. And Zuli says, well, I have an idea. Why don't you record them as videos and upload them onto YouTube for your family? And I immediately said, no, that is a horrible idea. YouTube is for cats playing piano. It is not for serious mathematics. But I got over the idea that it wasn't my idea. And I, uh, and I decided to give it a shot. And, uh, you know, at those first lessons I made, and they're still up there if you do a search by date in November 2006. Uh, these were just things I was getting a lot of questions on, you know, negative numbers, logarithms, things like that. And I started telling my cousins, why don't you watch these ahead of time so we can dig deeper when we get on the phone. And uh, after about a month, I asked them for feedback, and they famously said uh, they liked me better on YouTube than in person. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's worth introspecting on why they were saying that. And, and it's, to be clear, they they weren't saying that they didn't appreciate. In fact, you know, I think that was a, a major element of it, and we're seeing that more and more. Kind of, the human element is important, that there's a caring adult that's invested, that's motivating you. But what they were saying is actually something that's pretty obvious for any of us. You know, we've all tried to learn difficult things, and the first time you're learning it, to have a well, you know, even a well-wisher who's not trying to be judgmental kind of waiting for you to learn it is very stressful. You know, you explain it, and you're like, it's easy, right? Or you get it, and you kind of feel pressure to say, yeah, yeah, it makes sense. But you don't. Or maybe you're in algebra and you're embarrassed about a deficiency in arithmetic. Or you're in physics and you're embarrassed about a deficiency in algebra. And so now you can get it at your t own time and pace, repeat it as much as you want. There's no judgment, etc. So I took it as positive feedback, kept going. And it soon became clear that people who were not my cousins were watching. And at first, you know, I saw the view count go up. Uh, then I saw the comments started to come in on YouTube. A lot of those first comments were just, you know, simple thank yous. Even that I thought was a, a pretty big deal. I don't know how much time you spend on YouTube. Most of the comments are not thank you. <laughs> They're a little bit edgier. But then they got more intense. I got uh, you know, comments like, you know, this is the reason I was able to pass my algebra class. This is the reason why I, I, I'm not going to drop out of high school anymore. This is the reason why I think I can become an engineer now uh, after, grad, after leaving the military. In early 2007, I remember I brought my wife over. And there was this incredible letter that this mother had sent me saying that both of her sons had a learning disability, that these lessons were the only way that they could keep up with their class. And because of that, her and her entire family were praying for me and my entire family. And you can imagine how especially powerful that was for me. You have to remember, I was an analyst at a hedge fund. <laughs> I, I was not used to people praying for me, at least, <laughs> at least in that way. And so I, I know there's good hedge fund management, I'm sure many in the audience. But, but I, you know, so I, I, just, I, just, I just kept going. Uh, by fall of 2000 and, 
fall of 2009, I just frankly couldn't focus on my day job. And, you know, we had a little bit of savings for essentially a down payment on the house, but I sat down with my wife and it's like, like I think there's something real here. The social ROI could be kind of through the roof. And so she agreed. I set it up as a nonprofit and I, I quit my day job to work on Khan Academy full time. And I think anytime you do anything entrepreneurial, whether it's for profit or nonprofit, you kind of have to start with that delusional optimism. You assume that, you know, surely the world will, you know, recognize this, and in this case, you know, recognize to support the social ROI. But as soon as you do it, you start having a lot of conversations and you get a lot of, oh, this is nice, but it's not exactly what we do, or our budget this year is allocated, but you know, I'm sure you'll find someone. And so after about seven or eight months, I got really stressed. Uh, we were digging into our savings, about $5,000 a month. Our first child had just been born. I had a good job and you know, I'd kind of got rid of it and, and now I was li living off of nothing. And, and I was getting some donations off of PayPal, it was a few hundred dollars a month, if it was any of you, thank you. Uh, but, but it was stressful. And, and but right around then, all of a sudden, a $10,000 donation came through. And I immediately see who it is, her name is Ann Doerr. I saw that she was local by this point. My boss's wife had become a professor at Stanford Law School, so we were local uh, right near Palo Alto. And so uh, she said, uh, so I immediately emailed Ann, I had her email address, and I said, thank you so much for this incredibly generous donation. This is the largest donation Khan Academy has ever received. If we were a physical school, you would not have a building named after you. <laughs> and, and Ann immediately emails me back and says, well, I, I use it with my daughters, I use it myself, I'd like to learn more about what you're doing. And so we meet over lunch, and she says, well, what's your goal? And I said, look, uh, with, when you fill out the paperwork with the IRS to be a nonprofit, there's a part of the form that says mission, colon, they give you about a line and a half. And I filled out a free world-class education for anyone, anywhere. And Ann says, well, that's ambitious. Uh, how do you see yourself doing that? And I told her, you know, to be clear, this is just a mission. I don't plan on just being able to check it off this weekend and then move on to healthcare or something. But, but I, 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 showed, I said, look, you, know, you see the videos, we can translate it into the languages of the world, we can create tools for teachers, we can create a practice platform where students can practice, we can create simulations so that they can explore things. I used to walk around with a notebook of testimonials, I showed her how the usage was growing exponentially, and Anne said, well, you've made a surprising amount of progress, I only have one question, how are you supporting yourself? And in as proud of a way as possible, I said, I'm not. And so she kind of processes that a little bit. We part ways. Ten minutes later, I'm driving into my driveway, and I get a text message from Ann, and it says, you really need to be supporting yourself. I've just wired you $100,000. So that was a good day. <laughs> a little bit. And then, frankly, there was a, a beginning, a cascade of crazier and crazier events. A month later, I was running a summer camp for middle school students. I never viewed virtual as a substitute for the physical. I've always viewed it as something that could liberate the physical. So if you don't have to give lecture in the classroom, can you do simulations, games, whatever else? And so I had a trading floor. I had seven, I had six seventh graders playing a game of risk while the other tra 20 traded securities based on the outcome of the game of risk. It's a good game. And, and while that was happening, I start getting text messages from Ann, which you can imagine I now take very seriously. And, and there were five or six of them in a row, and I, I had trouble making sense of them, uh, what order they came in. But they, they read along the lines of, this is Anne writing, uh, I'm at the Aspen Ideas Festival, I'm in the main pavilion, uh, Bill Gates being interviewed on stage, last five minutes talking about Khan Academy. So I had no idea what she was talking about. I immediately boot the nearest seventh grader off of a computer and start looking for, for this, you know, is there live stream or something? And I was able to find the footage, and, and this is what I saw. There's a new uh, website that uh, I've just been using with my kids recently called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N. Just one guy doing some unbelievable 15-minute tutorials. My favorite vignette is that guy, uh, Salman Khan. He was a hedge fund guy uh, making lots of money, and he quit to do these little web videos. And so we have moved, I'd say, about 160 IQ points from the hedge fund category into the uh, uh, teaching uh, many, many people in a leveraged way category. So, you know, that was a, that was a good day, uh, the day that his wife let him quit his job. So you can imagine, I, you know, I, I was literally, I still remember that, you know, I was shaking. I, I actually became nervous. I said those videos were for Nadia, not Bill Gates. And, and, and you know, I, I go home that evening at dinner. You know, I told my wife about it. I showed her this video. And, and, and I remember just staring at her. I said, like, what, what do I do now? You know, what's the protocol here? Do I call him? assuming he's not listed. And, and so they, they leave me in that limbo state for about two weeks. Two weeks later, I'm, I'm in my walk-in closet. I'm about to record a video. 
and all of a sudden I see my cell phone rings, it's a Seattle number, I answer it, hello? Hi, this is Larry Cohen, I'm Bill Gates' chief of staff. Uh, you might have heard that uh, Bill's a fan. Yeah, I heard that. <laughs> and, and if you're free over the next few weeks, we'd love to fly you up to Seattle and learn more about what you're doing. And I was looking at my calendar for the month, completely blank. <laughs> Said, yeah, you know, I gotta cut my nails, do some laundry, but I think I can meet Bill. Uh, so we had that meeting, and it was eerily similar to the meeting with Anne. What would you do with more? You know, translate the language of the world, make it available, align it to the standards, eventually get to a credential even. Uh, at the same time, and these were all independent events, it, it turns out folks at Google were using it, they also reached out, and since then met many, many, many other folks, many of y'all in the room as well, to kind of help uh, build out this, this mission. But that's what essentially got us our start. In, in 2010, we were able to hire up a team, get office space, and become a real organization. And what we immediately started working on is, you know, the videos kept going, but also, especially the exercise platform, because we really wanted a chance for, it's one thing to get an explanation, but you really have to get practice and feedback and learn at your own pace. And we didn't even realize at the time, but we were implementing what's been known for a long time as personalized learning, mastery learning, and to appreciate what it is, it's, it's good to think about what traditional learning, the one that most of us grew up in, is like. In a traditional academic model, you group students together, usually by age, and then around middle school age and perceived ability, and you shepherd them together at the same pace. And let's say that uh, you have a, let's say we're in a, a middle school uh, math class and the topic is exponents. We have some lecture homework, lecture homework for a couple of weeks. Then we get an exam after two weeks. And let's say on that exam, I get a 70%, you get an 80%, you get a 95%. Even though that test has identified gaps, what was the 30% I didn't know? Even the A student, what was the 5% she didn't know? The whole class moves on to the next concept. Probably a concept that's going to build on those gaps. It might be negative exponents now, or logarithms. Somehow expecting me to learn logarithms even though I didn't know the 30% of basic exponents that happened to be on that exam. And then you keep getting pushed forward, you know, kind of on this, on this conveyor belt, accumulating these gaps, so at some point, you hit an algebra class and nothing makes sense anymore. Once again, it's not because algebra is difficult or because you're not bright. It's because you've accumulated all these gaps and all of a sudden that equation has an exponent in it or a negative exponent or logarithm and, and nothing, nothing makes sense. And to appreciate how absurd this is, imagine if we did other things in our life that way. Say, home building. So you bring in the contractor and you say, we have two weeks to build this foundation. Do what you can. So they, they do what they can, maybe it rains, maybe some of the supplies don't show up. Two weeks later, you bring in the inspector, and the inspector looks around, says, okay, that part's not quite up to code, uh, concrete's still wet over there, I'll give it an 80%. They say, great, that's a C, let's build the first floor. <laughs> Same thing, we have three weeks, do what you can, inspector shows up in three weeks, gives it a 95%. You're like, oh great, that's an A-, minus. let's build a second floor, third floor. And then while you're building the third floor, the whole structure collapses. And if your reaction is the reaction we typically have in education, you say, oh, well, maybe we had a bad contractor, or maybe we needed more inspections. And who knows, maybe that's part of it, but the real issue was the process was flawed. You're artificially constraining how long you have to do something, ensuring a variable outcome. You take the trouble of identifying the gaps, but then you completely ignore them, and then you try to build on top of it. So this whole notion of mastery learning, personalized learning, which is arguably the oldest way of learning, it's the way that, uh, you know, going back to Dr. Gopnik's presentation, it's where animals would learn in the wild. You know, you keep working on something until you've mastered that technique, or at least you get to a decent le baseline level of proficiency, and then you can, you can build on top of it, is, is what we're, we're really trying to promote here. So, I actually drew, I'm very proud, I drew this last night. But, 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 to, but to appreciate just how much potential there is out there if we just let people learn at their own pace, fill in their gaps, I'll show you this next video. So I actually uh, dropped out of high school twice, um, both during my freshman year. Um, and when I eventually came back, I was put in sort of lower level math and science classes because I was so behind. Um, then I discovered Khan Academy. Um, and I was able to skip two years worth of math just through using the site. And I came into school, I took the exam with students who had been enrolled in the class all year, and I was actually able to get the highest or the second highest scores in the class. Um, so for me, Khan Academy really changed the trajectory of my entire life. 
um, because without it, I don't think I ever really would have been inspired to, to learn and to love math and to love science. Um, I ended up graduating as a valedictorian and going on to Princeton, where I'm now a computer science major, and I'm absolutely passionate about learning, about computers, about math, about science. Um, and without Khan Academy, I don't think that these things would really matter to me the way that they do today. So, you know, when you, think of, when you look at the Charlie Marshes of the world, you know, uh, we said, well, how do we do this for more students? And so a, a neat opportunity showed up with the College Board, who they're the people who make the SAT and the AP. And so as of two years ago, uh, they reached out and said, hey, we want to address this inequity around test preparation. And so they said, can we do something together? And so as of two years ago, Khan Academy is now the official practice for the SAT. And what's exciting about it is, and many of you all have uh, children who are maybe uh, taking the PSAT, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. In the past, when you took the PSAT, which is 80% of American students, it was just this random test you took in 10th or 11th grade. Now when you get your PSAT score, it comes with a little link. And if you click on the link and if you give Khan Academy permission, it acts as a diagnostic for personalized learning. So then the Khan Academy software can say, oh, this is the type of, you know, you're strong at quadratics, you're weak at decimals, you're strong at this type of grammar question, you're weak at this type of reading comprehension, and it can immediately start doing personalized practice for the students. And what's neat is we're then able to follow the student from that initial diagnostic through Khan Academy all the way to the SAT. And we recently uh, had a study that we just, we just published a few months ago, and it showed that the students who did at least 20 hours that was associated with twice as much gain as you would typically see from the PSA to the SAT. And you know, for those of you who have young kids and you're trying, I met a few of y'all earlier today, if you're trying to motivate it, we, and I, we haven't released this publicly, it, it is actually roughly an hour was equating to five points. And, and the point here isn't that this is a test that you can game. If anything, the SAT more than ever is about the things that you should be learning in school. The point here is that if students take the time to practice and fill in those gaps that they had accumulated up to this point, that that actually is the most valuable form of practice versus kind of what you would traditionally associate with something like test prep. The other really interesting, exciting things for us is, you know, that these studies now we can do with 250,000 students, a million students, and we can do studies like this almost continuously. And even things like this would have seemed science fiction uh, even, even a few years ago. And so with that same vein, uh, we've now partnered with the LSAT. So this is going to be launched in, within the year. Anyone practicing for the law school admissions test will now get free uh, preparation for it, uh, the MCAT and the nursing examination. And you know what's exciting is we're already seeing that more students, that the majority of students are now using these free resources. And it's being used more than four times all of paid test prep combined. And a, a nice side effect is that the price points are also coming down. So all of this hopefully just becomes more accessible. This is obviously free, but the price points in the market are coming down uh, because of hopefully a, a nice little catalyst. So these are just more efficacy studies, and you know we could talk more about these. But you know, there's the, maybe the most interesting one is the Brazil uh, that we're in process of, of releasing soon. But this is a you know these are this was actually our first control study where we saw the, the classrooms that were able to swap out an hour with doing personalized learning and being able to do that in a way where the peers were tutoring each other and using Khan Academy as a tool, we're able to see 30% gain. And so that leads into a question that a lot of y'all are thinking is, well, what about the rest of the planet? Everything I've talked about so far, most of what I've talked about is, is the US. And, and these are all pictures of Khan Academy being used at you know, different places. They're all exciting stories, and this is mainly due to the work of other NGOs who are taking it out into the field. Probably the coolest is, uh, the one there in the top right, that young woman up there, her name is Zaya, and she sent me an email about two years ago, and it had a link to a video testimonial, and I click on the video testimonial immediately, and it was very similar to Charlie Marsh's. She talks about loving math and science and, and you know, wanting to learn more and going into becoming a scientist, and when I looked at that, she was in Mongolia. I immediately assumed she must be middle class or upper middle class because her English was quite good, she had access to the internet, but it turns out that there was a group of engineers from Cisco Systems who were using their vacation time to go to Mongolia and set up computer labs in orphanages. And what you see in the top right there, those were the orphan girls using Khan Academy, and Zaya was one of those orphans. And that by itself was like you know, something out of a science fiction book. But what's been even cooler since then is that Zaya has since then become our top contributor to Khan Academy in the Mongolian language. So now she is teaching millions of her peers in Mongolia. Once again, like Charlie, you see just how much potential there is if you let people tap into it. 
And a similar story, this, is, this came out this year. This is an a op-ed by Nicholas Kristof, uh, Meet Sultana, the Taliban's worst fear. So about seven years ago, uh, Sultana was in Afghanistan. Taliban takes over her town, forbids all the young girls from going to school. She was about 13 years old, threatened them with acid attacks. I mean, horrible, horrible stuff. Luckily, Sultana had a, a, a computer at home. She had uh, kind of fairly enlightened family members who wanted her to keep learning. She self -ed teaches herself English over the internet, which is a little scary, but it worked for her. And she asked a relative, hey, find me any reading material you can find in English. So one of her relatives had to go to Pakistan, comes back with a Time magazine in English. And in that Time magazine, there happened to be an article on Khan Academy. And she learns about this, and then she immediately says, oh, I have to go there. This is, this is my, my ticket, so to speak. And so for the last six, seven years, she's been learning on Khan Academy, essentially starting off as a kind of a, even before middle school level, all the way she got her calculus, her physics, her chemistry, and she decides that she wants to be a physicist. And she wants to become a physicist and come to the US. And so she smuggles herself into Pakistan to take the SAT because it's not administered in Afghanistan. This is one of the 30-hour journey, illegal journey, one of the most dangerous borders in the world, to take the SAT. She does surprisingly well. This is when we find out about her. She met someone who contacted us, and then we start trying to lobby for her to be able to come to the US somehow. Luckily, Nicholas Kristof also finds out about her, writes this article, and then this allowed her to get political asylum in the US. And what's exciting is, as we speak, Sultan is now in the US, and she's starting to do research with one of the top physicists at MIT. So it's a very, uh, so as you can imagine, uh, you know, it, international is a big deal. This is what you know, the splash pages of Khan Academy look like in various countries. And it's not just the videos, it's the platform, it's the teacher tools, et cetera. But just to get a feel of what at least the videos look like in other languages, I'll, I'll show you this. L'hypoténuse commune, OK. Si, je sais. so interesting and funny, make more lessons. I watch that when I get lazy. That's the, uh, so. So, so this is just, you know, reframing kind of what we're trying to do. If we can create the pathways in every language, not just lessons, but interactive practice, tools for teachers, but also ways that students can learn on their own so they can start it as early as possible and get all the way so that they can prove themselves, either engage in the formal higher education system, or at least even have pathways to a job. And what we're starting to work on right now, and hopefully I can make an announcement about it in the next three years, is some type of a global diploma. So that whether you are a refugee, or you are Zaya, or you are Sultana, or you're a young kid who grows up in, you know, in Louisiana, and, and you, you can prove your, your worth to uh, anyone in the world. And what you you know, see here, these are, are just more pictures of, of folks using Khan Academy around the planet. And you know, what I tell everyone involved in, in what's going on, and it's much bigger than Khan Academy. I, you know, I, I was learning about a lot of the things that the Museum of Science is doing and spreading uh, a lot of the science and engineering around the world. There, there's, a, there's a movement going around, around education. And, and to, to kind of appreciate what's possible, I'll give a, a, a kind of final thought experiment. Imagine going back in time 400 years to Western Europe, which even then was one of the more literate parts of the planet. What you would have seen is about 15% of the population knew how to read, about 20% of men and 10% of women. And I suspect that if you ask someone who did know how to read, say a member of the clergy, and you said, what percentage of the population do you think is even capable of reading? They would say, well, with a great education system, maybe it's 30%, 40%, maybe 50%. Well, you fast forward to today, and we know that that would have been a wildly pessimistic prediction. Pretty close to 100% of the population is capable of reading. But if I were to ask any of y'all, uh, what percentage of the population do you think is capable of, uh, of, of finding the cure for cancer, of pushing the frontiers of math or physics, of starting uh, the next great tech startup, writing the great next great novel? You might say, well, right now, that's sub 1%. Maybe with a great education system, it could be 5%, 10%. 
Well, what if that's just based on kind of the blinders we have on from our own experience, where either we or we saw our peers kind of being pushed along on this treadmill, accumulating gaps. So at some point, you saw a bunch of our peers fall off of it at algebra, a bunch more at calculus, a bunch more at physics and genetics. So at the end, by the time you get to grad school, it is sub 1% that have even gotten that far. But what if we do allow a world where anyone can actually fill in those gaps, can have personalized learning, can, can learn whatever they want, and then eventually prove what they have so they can plug into the world? Well then, and I get more, every time I give this talk, I get more and more optimistic. I, you know, I, I think it's, it could be 30, 40, 50, and I think we might surprise ourselves that it could be 80, 90, and even close to 100%. And that's cool for a lot of reasons and important for a lot of reasons. One, it starts to address you know, this big topic that everyone's talking about, self-driving trucks and AI. Wh you know, we're, what's going to happen to all the jobs? What are people going to do? Well, they can move up uh, uh, the value chain. And even more, selfishly, it'll just be a super cool time to live. We could have 10 times as many people looking for cures for diseases, solving global warming, figuring out how we'll get to the, the, the next solar system. And you know, most importantly, this thing called education that has always been uh, the, the main bridge to, to empowerment, but it's always been scarce and expensive, will be just like clean drinking water or basic shelter and just a fundamental human right. Thank you. Oh well, aren't we all lucky to be affiliated with the Museum of Science? And to be able to have people like Alison and Sal come and, uh, and share the wonderful things they have done uh, for the world with us. And you're both a true inspiration. And Alison, we are planning on doing a lot more for young children in the transformation on, on the Blue Wing, which is our next uh, huge project for the next 10 years and we would hope that you would be a partner. And Sal, you are true inspiration. We do do things internationally, and you even put more energy uh, in us into trying to do things internationally, because uh, we should, at the end, we should care about the difference we make in children's life all over the world, and not necessarily how much money we get from every transaction, so it's wonderful. So before we go, I would like to ask all of you to save the date from the museums 2018 series, Stars of STEM celebration, which is going to be on April 12th, 2018. That's Thursday, April 12th. And I hope we will see you here. And good night. And thank you for a wonderful evening.